Hey everyone, welcome to episode three of the Miami Tech Pod. I'm Cesar Fernandez, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Brian Breslin, Maria Durchy, and Will Weinrop. And we have a special guest on the pod today, Maxime Tuckman, of the CEO of Caribou, one of the fastest growing ed tech startups in the country. Max, welcome to the Miami Tech Pod. Thank you for having me. We'll, we'll talk about Caribou in a bit, um, but first, how's everyone's week? Awesome. So far, so good. Anything's better than last week, so... You mean when we almost lost the capital? <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of my favorite stories this week was about the Viking guy who was complaining that he didn't have organic food in his prison cell. Like, I saw that. I saw that. Was that really a thing? Like, that? I don't know. Even if it wasn't real, it like it made me laugh. So that was my <laughs> highlight of the week. Tough Plot Viking twist. Guy. Plot twist: No quinoa in jail. Yeah. Um, or right. only quinoa in jail. That's a good point. Uh, well, let's let's jump into it. Will. Yeah, sure. We got a lot of good stuff on, on this week's episode. We're excited to have Max. Max is, you know, someone I consider to be one of the shining stars here in Miami Tech and so grateful for your time. And I guess like the thing I want to lead with here is Caribou. And you guys are absolutely crushing it. You've had an amazing year in 2020. I mean, in a year where everything kind of went sideways, we kind of had to reinvent, you know, how we interact with our friends and family. You know, a lot of people really thank their lucky stars for something like Caribou to be there to connect with their loved ones if they're not able to be in the same room with them. We have a lot of people, you know, that are older age, a lot of senior citizens, a lot of grandparents that want to be close to their grandchildren. But obviously, when the pandemic started, that was the thing that we heard on the news is do not let the grandkids be with the grandparents. That's one of the most dangerous things that you could allow to happen. So how do we fill in this gap that allows grandparents to see their grandkids? in comes caribou to the rescue and in such a great way because you were named one of apple's 15 most incredible apps of the year right so huge, and there it is for the folks that are watching on video you'll see the the yes. award here it's like 20 pounds this thing is so heavy because i was so excited when we when we got it and i was going to wear it like a like a necklace like flavor flav and it's it's like <laughs> no way to do that so I have to leave it, here. it I looks legit I want Do we to think it's made out of recycled phones? Make earrings. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah, it is. It's the same titanium as the Mac. Yeah, it's and there's um, it's the uh, Apple's most exclusive product because they only made fifteen of these. Wow. And one is sitting Aki in the three hundred five. Just saying. Love that. <laughs> Love that. Claimed one for the city. This would have been really good for like a DJ horn moment. Pa -pa -pa. <laughs> <laughs> I can add that in post. Okay. 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 <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yeah, so I want to talk about this amazing year you've had. Uh, l let's kind of rewind a second. Yeah. Like 2020 hits, the pandemic hits sometime in March. Everybody's like, doesn't know what the fuck just happened. We're all, you know, reacclimating into what this new world is going to be. Talk to me as an entrepreneur, like, where's the moment that you're like, we need to step our game up because we could really help people. Like, I want to know your thought process that really took Caribou to the next level as the pandemic was rising back in March. Yeah. So, um, you know, Caribou's always had a use case, right? Grandparents yeah. are always far away from their grandkids. Divorced families need a better video calling experience with kids, traveling parents. So Caribou was like chugging along. We were a tiny little team of four. Um, we were we were getting there. And, and actually, funny story, uh, shout out to the Venture City, because the meeting where we made the decision about how we were going to respond to the pandemic was at, it was our last in-person meeting. It happened at the Venture City. Luna, Lunita La Cubanita was there, my dog, um, <laughs> and Maria was, and it was, it was early March. Uh, and so I have a ton of international friends and we also have international customers. Before the pandemic, we were already in 164 countries. So we saw this coming, right? And so we've seen it, we saw it coming since June, uh, January. We, a bunch of my friends with kids, their kids had been out of school and they were sheltering in place in, in China and in South Korea and Japan. And um, so like, we kind of knew this was coming. So then March comes, we have this in-person meeting at the Venture City and we say, we have got to respond. And one of the things that I had been doing in January and February was really studying the 2018, sorry, 1918 pandemic. Um, and I had been looking at it and, and it was a 12 to 18 
month ordeal, right? And so, you know, as March is coming around, every, I remember specifically like parents were like, oh, I'm taking my kids out of school for two weeks. And look on Instagram, how amazing my little like homeschool <laughs> area is. And it's gonna be amazing for two weeks. And I was like, oh, mama, like it's gonna be 12 to 18. So we were ready and like, we were prepared for a 12 to 18 month kind of need for caribou. And, and that was at, at the venture city, we made the decision to go free. And to go, if we were one of the only ed tech companies, we were the first ed tech company to kind of go free. And we were the first, ed, we were the only, I kind of think, ed tech company that said, we're just free. We're not giving like, a, a lot of people were like, for 30 days, for two weeks, for 60 days. And we were like, no, 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 no. We know this thing. You're in it to win it. Like, just enjoy care. But we just couldn't, uh, we just couldn't live in a world where a child wasn't able to connect with a family member that they knew and loved through the pandemic because they couldn't afford the price point. Um, and the, the, the craziest part of this whole story is that, so March 14th, so I go to bed at like six, seven in the morning, just do the thing. Yeah. And, never expect an email from Max at like eight in the morning, nine, you'll so hear from her like past news. You're a to total night owl. You're, you're cranking it all yeah. night long. My, my like most, cause think about it, right? Like from the moment I wake up to, you know, the moment I go to like, well, till like midnight, I, mm. especially because of West coast, I am just in meetings on uh, like, right. I'm producing, I'm like doing external stuff. And then like midnight to six, 7 a.m., like it's quiet and I can respond to everybody and I can follow up. And so like 12 to seven is like my jam time. Okay, so seven, it's like, I think it was 7 a.m. March 14th, I um, posted everything before I went to bed and I was like, caribou is free. Like have at it, please use it. Tell your family about it, tell your friends about it. And I literally just posted on, our, on my social networks and I was like, please. Um, 24 hours later, we had 10 X the company. Wow. That's crazy. Like, right. Like everyone is always trying to 10 X their company in a couple of years. Like we 10 X in 24 hours, number of downloads, accounts created, number of books, read minutes, you know, calls made like everything 10 X in 24 hours. And so that was Saturday, March 14th. Right. So Sunday, March 15th, I get a call from AT and T who's one of our investors. And um, it's it's this woman that we worked with in the incubator, and she's like, "I just saw that you went free. This is amazing. Families need this. How can we help?" Literally, like it was like a Mayor Suarez, right? Like, <laughs> How can we help? And I was like, "You could sponsor the subscriptions. You know, we've always wanted to do that. We've always wanted to have corporate partner sponsor subscriptions." She's like, "We're in. How much do you need?" And I was like, "I'm like back of the math, I'm like you know, yeah. Palmetto High School math. I'm like, Wah. and I was like." half a million dollars. She's like, I'll get it approved. Wow. That's amazing. Like, we had half a million dollars from AT&T to, to subsidize the free subscriptions for families during the pandemic. And it was amazing. So yeah, it was, it was one of those decisions also that was easier for us to make because we had just raised uh, through equity crowdfunding. So we had money, we, we felt like the technology was good. We, we knew we needed to do this. And then yeah, you know, when you do good things, like when you decide just to go free, because you're like, I think we can, I think we can, and also we're technology, right? Like it's it's easy for us to to be able to do that. Um, those those other amazing things just kind of happen. That's awesome. And and as it continued, I mean, growth just can continue to compound throughout the year, right? You kept expanding, and and then you know more and more downloads, and then it comes to the end of the year, and you're rated as one of the top fifteen most important apps of 2020. How did you hear about that? Did you looked at the app store one day and it said that you're there. Do you get an email from Tim Cook? Like, how does that happen? <laughs> so yeah, Apple is stealth, man. So they, um, uh, we just got an email from Apple being like, hi, uh, can you sign this NDA? We have something we'd like to talk to you about. And when Apple says like, can you sign this NDA? You're like, yeah, absolutely. I will. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you're not fighting on um, that one. Yeah. So about a month before, uh, the announcement, we were, um, we were told by Apple, they, and they wouldn't tell us what it was. And remember they had just had their like one more thing. So we were like, what's happening? Like, what is it? The second, wait, 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 we have one more, we have another thing. <laughs> and so we didn't know what it was. And, uh, and they were super like vague about it. And they were like, we can't tell you what it is, but just be prepared. And like, you know, we're going to, and they did, um, to their credit, they did like two days of press with us before the announcement so that, uh, you know, and it was, international. I mean, you know, these are the top, these are the best 15 apps in 2020 in the world. Um, so it was amazing. We were in all of these uh, outlets across the world. And our customers are now in over 200 countries and territories. By the way, FIFA 
I think I think the UN only recognized 196 countries. FIFA recognizes 211, so whatever. And then we're in like almost like 206, I think, uh, countries. Literally, where people are like you making calls. Amazing. That's so, so you're in more countries than the UN recognizes. Right. <laughs> Care who is creating peace around the world. How, how so does then, that? How, how does that make your family feel? Right, like when you when you walk through some of those metrics and achievements, you know, you're like kind of woman who's like from Miami and, and a Latina and all of that, like, is it still a little bit of, you know, pinch yourself every day when you, when you hear yourself talk about that success? I think it's, yeah, I, so, you know, my, I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust immigrants, right? Or Holocaust survivors and Cuban immigrants. And um, my family has, has fled so much persecution and has had to reinvent themselves and learn new languages and, and speak Spanglish, Yiddish, and then they fled to Puerto Rico. And like, it's just, you know, the the stories of what my family had to do and sacrifice for me to be born here in the U.S. and Miami, sort of the U.S., is like, you just, every day, you feel like you haven't accomplished enough to make up for it, right? So like, all of the things I've done in my career, I still feel like I'm like, oh my God, like, I still haven't made up for it. Like, I so every day when I win an award or when something crazy, like, amazing happens, like, I'm still like, I still need to... Um, it's, uh, it's just, it's, I don't know. I, I bet a lot of you have the same thing where it's like, you just want to make your parents proud. Like that's the best gift you could give them. And, um, I feel like that's why I try and overachieve just, you know, so that my parents <laughs> can tell their friends <laughs> like, Oh, my daughter did this. Right. Cause like, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's all the parents want to do. They just want to brag on you. So I try and give them as much stuff as I can. Does your mom still not understand what you do for a living? Well, she uses caribou, so oh, now she yeah. finally does because, yeah, for a really long time, there were a lot of jobs that I had where she was like, yeah, I don't know what she's doing. Uh, but now, yeah, uh, it's pretty exciting. And and, there's, and I remember I remember having the conversation like my, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm the first to graduate from college in my family. And I went and then became a public school teacher, right, with Teach for America. And my parents were like, what in the hell? Literally, you're the first one to go get this college degree and you're going to go get a thirty thousand dollar job as a teacher like what you know and not that they had anything against teachers it was just like max you got the college degree like go get the big job that you know we all dreamed of and um and my mom says that my uh salary has been like um carbon dating you know how like it halves right so like <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> so when i started caribou uh i had just left the treasury department and i had like this big thick figure salary and was possibly going to stay at, at the treasury department until I met Alvaro and was like, this is awesome. Let's do this. And I remember seriously having that conversation with my parents where they were like, are you, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you taking this risk? Like, why are you leaving something so amazing and so secure? Uh, and, and what if like, what if you fail at this? What if you you know, can't eat or, or pay for your dog's health insurance? Like serious thing. Um, and I don't know. I've just, since the moment that Alvaro and I started talking about caribou, like, I've never, ever, for one minute, doubted that we'd be successful. Like, like even with seven hundred dollars in my bank account, I was like, "We're gonna make this work." Like, so. Well, then, cut to uh, December of this year, or, or it might have been November, and then you all of a sudden get. How did the Today Show reach out? How did that whole thing come about? Yeah, so we got connected to the Today Show and they were excited to talk about it. So this is before Apple announced anything. This was literally just the Today Show being like, wow, you know, we've heard about Caribou. This could actually be super helpful to our viewers, um, you know, especially for the holidays. The CDC was already uh, starting to sort of say that you shouldn't travel for the holidays. Um, so uh, the Today Show uh, did a three minute segment on us, right? Um, it's, it's a segment called She Made It which is like a play on words because I made it, but I made it. I don't know. I like it. Um, it's great. Yeah, it's cute. It's, it's cute. And, um, and it was just a great interview. And we got to talk about, you know, what Caribou does for families and like being able to talk on national television on the Today Show for three minutes to moms and glamas. Uh, so that's our core customer, by the way, glamas, glamorous grandmas. And in Spanish, mm. abuelas, abuelas fabulosas. <laughs> abuelas. Porque estamos en Miami. And... <laughs> So like, that was just this amazing, amazing opportunity. And so that was on its own right, just like, right? Like all the numbers like, Wah. okay. So then that night I'm like digging through my emails 
from midnight to 7 a.m. Dings are ringing. <laughs> and who's the guy from Dog Vacay? Aaron? Yes, Aaron Hershorn. Yeah, so Aaron, I have an email from Aaron. Like, by the way, I used Dog Vacay. I think Aaron is so great. I love Dog Vacay, but I've never actually like met him. So I have this email from Aaron in my inbox. Um, and it's like, hey, the founder of TaskRabbit wants to connect with you. And I was like, okay, that's so random, but that's really cool. So I, I connect with Leah. So it's Leah, Leah Soliban. And um, she she's like, Max, I just happened to be on maternity leave. Um, and that's why I was watching the Today Show. And I was sitting there watching what you're doing and who you are. And she's like, I just love it. Um, how can I help? And I was like, you know, we want to take advantage of the holidays. Like we're, we're crushing it. We're doing all these things. And she's like, I want to invest. And I was like, okay. Like, and with literally within two weeks, like the day before Thanksgiving, million dollars invested into Caribou. Like just phenomenal. And because of that, we ended up raising, you know, some more money, you know, because it was just, it was the Apple thing and the holidays and people were just super excited. And we brought on, um, so all of our investors were either women, then Leah, who's a woman and Latina, right? Puerto Rican and a black man. So out of the four new investors that we brought on, um, it was all diverse investors. So they're strategic AF and also just phenomenally diverse and and just amazing human beings um so it uh yeah it was a good end to the year i, I have a quick question on the on the tech during all of this because i've seen that you know a lot of companies that saw really big spikes in traffic and uh in you know during the pandemic with people home and, and you know kind of shifting their behavior and all of that um there are some companies you know zoom comes to mind that just flawlessly executed right like you know may have been choppy for half a day but then for the most part they were just like, yeah, of course we can take, you know, 600,000% growth week over week um, with no problem, right? Like we'll have, you know, great quality audio and video. Um, did you all have a little bit of, you know, behind the scenes freak out? Like, can we actually sustain this level of, of traffic coming to, to the app? There's always behind the scenes freak outs. So yes. Uh, well, but the funny story is that Alvaro, my co-founder and our CTO, who no one believes uh, that I actually, that he exists um, because he's he's like this, the quiet one, right? Like, as you can tell, I'm a little loud and overpowering, um, but I do have a co-founder, he's amazing. And uh, I remember, I mean, again, we were such a small company before the pandemic hit. And he, um, he would always tell me, he's like, Max, we're built on technology that can scale. He's like, if we go to 10,000 downloads a day tomorrow, like we can, like if we get featured in the app store, right? Like we can scale. And I was always like, mm. <laughs> I was always a little sus. And then, and then literally we 10 X the company and everything was fine. Like it didn't break. It was, uh, you know, I've always had faith in my co-founder. He's uh, uh, amazing and so smart and I trust him with my life. But I that one I was like, let's let's see what happens. And he was right again. I mean, it was just phenomenal. And I think, you know, when you're building technology, especially when you're building technology like we are, which is we're multi-platform. So we're actually the world's first multi-platform video calling experience for kids and families now. Because you can call from iOS to Android, phone to tablet, and all that to computer. So like literally think about all the complexities, right? Just think of even Android. Um, and all the different hardwares and the different, you know, things that can go wrong and the sizes and all the screen resolution. And then, you know, it's, it's, and also like, think about how few things you can use to video call, um, cross platform from iOS to, to Android. Um, you know, FaceTiming is reserved for families that all have Apple. So there's a lot of complexity in it. And I was, I was just, again, always amazed by my co-founder that, uh, nothing broke. Congratulations, honestly. I mean, it's a it's a amazing thing to to see, but also like it really sounds like you had fun during the 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 ups and downs of it. But for the most part, you're coming out ahead. You know, um, probably optimistic about the next couple quarters and and you know all of that. Can you share what's what's in store? What's you know the the roadmap for the end of the year? Well, the you know the 2021 story I think is is exciting as well, right? I think there's a lot of people that saw a huge spike in 2020, right? Saw a lot of growth, but then it's been declining. And I was actually literally on a call with an investor where I said, you know, they were like, what question do you have for us? And I was like, really the most, the, the thing I'm most interested in is like, what is the consumer trend that you think is going to 
uh, you know, kind of continue in 2021, right? Because um, I, I, especially after the vaccine, because I think that's been the story too, is like, oh, what does the vaccine do to a lot of these companies that saw growth in 2020? But if you think, first of all, let's say, let's start with the, if you think about what's happening with the vaccine, back to Will's point, grandparents, right? Seniors are getting the, the vaccine first. Grandkids are gonna be last. So we're still gonna have multi-generational families that need to connect safely um, from a distance. So I think 2021 is still gonna be our, our year. And this investor said, look, you know, online shopping for food, right? So food delivery already down. Telehealth, probably gonna go down. But the thing that's not going to go down is messaging and communicating with Agreed. family. Agreed. I think to that point, a lot of the same kind of trends carry over to like the future of work. Like we're going to see this hybrid solution for a very long time. Now that we've had a year in this experience and we've seen how efficient we can be, you know, working remotely, doing things like video chatting with our families and all that stuff and with our coworkers, you can't unscramble this egg. You know what I mean? Once you go there, you kind of just know that that's kind of where we're, we're heading and you see all these trends going in that direction. There's no doubt that you're just going to see more kids now that they spent a year on video calls with their schools, video video chatting with their grandparents, video chatting with their friends. The, the video chat usage is just going to keep picking up and picking up. And hopefully, obviously, we mix in some real world stuff we need to. They'll be get, getting back to playing sports and they'll be getting back to seeing their their grandparents when it's safe to. But you'll see kids reach for the iPad more to say, please call grandma more than ever before. Well, really quick story. So we have an MLS soccer player that uses Caribou with his kids and he was at a game and wanted to call the kids really quickly before the game. And so he called them on FaceTime and the girls hung up on him on FaceTime and called him back on Caribou. Because they were like, uh, why would you call us on the boring video call platform? Like, call us on the really fun one where we can draw right. with you and read a story with you. So, yeah. You That's another thing I thought. Like, like, the kids get bored of video chat after five minutes, you know, that you really yeah. need something to get their attention. So, I, I love what you guys are doing. I think you are the future of that, you know, early childhood video calling. And I think you, the future is super bright for Caribou. And I'm, we're so grateful you're here in the Miami Tech ecosystem. Well, I have to give you a shout out, Will. Like it, you know, it started with the Live Ninja Waffle Wednesday days, right? It's uh, that's where where a lot of these ideas were born. So, have appreciate thought. that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so, stick around, Max. We have a couple other topics. I feel like you'll you'll be really good at jumping in and and sharing your wisdom. Uh, you know, Maria, what do you have for us this week? So something that we published recently on Refresh was a Welcome to Miami guide. We kept getting all these questions over Twitter. What neighborhoods uh, should we live in? What restaurants? Um, mainly from new folks, but even folks that have been here a while that don't feel as plugged into the ecosystem. Uh, and so Brian, actually, credit to him, like years ago had started writing up this guide. And he said, let's, you know, let's actually update it, revive it uh, and, and get it live on the site uh, it could be really helpful to folks so we brought in some of the team at um refresh marcella mccarthy who's one of our writers did an incredible job of kind of updating the guide uh chris adamo at nootropic weighed in and kind of we published the first iteration of it uh and it's a, it's both some of our own content and then links to a bunch of helpful resources it is a very version 1.0 uh we it's a living and breathing document. We welcome anybody to send us uh, feedback. I'm sure we missed a ton of things um, and we're going to continue to update it at least on a weekly basis uh, and also make a very much prettier version of it. Um, but it's been really, you know, the reception has been great and I think a lot of folks are finding it useful. Um, I think some folks are enjoying mostly the idiosyncrasies part of it where we kind of, you know, talk about some of Miami's ways uh, so yeah, so hopefully it's helpful and please email us at team at refreshmiami.com if you have other resources to add or any feedback. Welcome. We're welcoming it. So I think one of the reasons we like two years ago that I started drafting this was because I'm one of these people who like if I get asked the same question a thousand times, like I decide, oh, well, let me write this into a doc so Don't I can just share that it. because I'm lazy, right? <laughs> uh, and then, but also Miami is kind of a tough city to understand if you're not from here, you know, because we're so unique, right? I mean, all of us are natives, which is mind boggling to me that we're having a podcast with five native 
native Miamians, right? Like, aside from, like, once I left high school, I assumed that none of my friends would ever be locals again, you know? Um, but Which is a good Miami, point. How many of you that when someone meets you and they're like, where are you from? And you say Miami, they're like, you're the only person I've ever met from here. But that happens like every like, time. Yeah, they're like, no one was born in Miami. You don't have hospitals. <laughs> There's no <laughs> pediatric wards. There's no or maternity ward. No. Because on the first date with my wife, you know, when we first met, this was like a five minute conversation. Like, where are you from? I'm from Miami. No, no, where are you from? No, like from? originally from, yeah, like, no. And no, from then, Miami. And then the question pops up always. Where did you go Where to school? Where did you go to high school? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great point, too, that we're, we realized right before this podcast is we're all products of Miami-Dade County Public Schools. So yep. everybody, uh, I'm a Coral Reef High grad. Uh, Brian, go ahead. I went to Coral Gables. Um, and funny enough, like there's like a thread here because last episode we had Chris Sofer, and I, I made a comment that I met my wife at Chris Sofer's apartment. Funny enough, there's a thread here because... My wife went to high school with Max. Same oh, year. Yes. As well. It's like the coolest thing. Yes. And so. my sister and we, well, we both went to middle school with Max at Southwood Middle. Yes. And, and Maria's sister and I started an animal rights group uh, together. That's and This is not surprising at all. <laughs> right. This is the Miami, the two degrees of separation. It's and then like will one, we learn? One yeah. Will, we learned you went to Beach High. Yep, Beach High. Go High Tides. I went there before it looked like Apple Campus, before the whole, you know, <laughs> renovate. Right now it looks like a spaceship, but before uh, before all that, man, I loved my high school experience. I loved Beach High. Beach High is pretty amazing. Yeah. Max, you mentioned you went to Palmetto. I actually went to Dash and Palmetto because, oh, yeah. you know, one school is not enough for me. But yeah, I, yeah, I graduated. Where did you go? I went to G. Holmes Braddock High School way out west. That uh, thing had like, that was always the school that was known as like the school that had like 5,000 people. Yes. Yeah. Our, <laughs> our graduating class was 1,000 people. Um, and it's it's way out there. Uh, I don't think it's going to be like the first top in the top 10 places that people go to, uh, you know, when, when they move to Miami from, from San Francisco. City, right? no, it's way, way out there, you know, 147th Avenue, you know, like all that. So. It goes to back to the point why this guide is needed because Miami is such a sprawled out city. It's easy for someone to come to Miami, stay in one pocket and get the completely wrong impression of Miami if they haven't explored it. At all, so that's why this guide is amazing. I encourage anybody that hasn't checked it out to check it out. We'll make sure in the show notes to uh, to put direct links to it. And Brian, Maria, like you guys said, you're always improving this, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And well, that's a the size thing is another thing people don't really understand that Miami Dade County is like the size of Rhode Island. Like, like we're basically comparing ourselves to an entire state, and I think we have more people than Rhode Island, but still, like. You know, yep. for context, it's it's crazy. We're also a county that has like concrete jungle and like farms. Right. Like literally within an hour, you're in a farm or you're in like downtown. We also have two national parks with Everglades and Biscayne National Park. What about Alita? That's a, that's a state park. Oh. Yeah. I thought it was. A, <laughs> I thought it was. was park I also too. can never remember if it's Alita or Oleda. I always would pronounce it in Spanish. I'm like Oleda. Oleda is great. Know, Alita's like this little hidden gem for most people that are coming to town that don't know about it. It's, it really uh, is. You can go mountain biking. Yeah. I live in Aventura. <laughs> <Edmonton. laughs> for, for those listening, like on Spotify or Apple or, or iTunes, uh, mountain biking was in hard air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. Well, so another question we keep getting um, is kind of top of everyone's mind where is tech going to kind of is there going to be a one central place for the tech community in Miami? Mm -hmm. um, so would love to get everyone's thoughts on it, the I, central. I, so I think this is really an interesting question because like we look at like other tech communities and stuff like that. And we say like, all right, well, everything is all VC activities on Sand Hill Road, right? Or um, a ton of the stuff in San Francisco is in like Soma or something like that, right? Or in New York, it's near Flatiron District or whatever it is, right? And so the, I think people were hung up for a while as far as where is it all going to concentrate here in Miami. And for a while, Wynwood was sort of gaining a ton of steam. 
But I guess this is more of an open question to the, the four of you. Like, where do you guys think there'll be the highest density of uh, of tech activity? You know, and will it be the same neighborhood as where all these new VCs have transplanted to? And I'd love to hear from Will, considering you were kind of like very early on off live. Uh, Live Ninja's offices were in Wynwood. So, did you guys quickly get kind of priced out? How did that all happen? Well. Uh we would have got priced out if we, if the, if we didn't uh, sell the company, if the company wasn't acquired when it was, there was no way we were going to be able to afford the rents because it, it grew astronomically in the, uh, the four or five years that we were there. So we would have definitely got priced out, but the company got acquired and then the acquiring company, you know, ended up footing the bill until it was too expensive for them too. And they said also, uh, you know, there's really no justification for this cost of an office. I think Wynwood is an amazing place. There's design everywhere. There's inspiration everywhere. So for folks in the tech scene, it's great to kind of walk around. It's just, it, there's an energy there like no other. And you got companies like Shopify announced that they're having an office there. Um, there's a few, you know, uh, there's obviously the lab and other mainstays. Win -code. Win -code. Yeah, WinCode has a, its campus there. Absolutely. Um, and Didn't then you Pipe have- say they were going to Winwood as well? Yeah, so hey. they, they announced that, I believe. Um, and then you have like a mainstay Panther coffee was the closest thing we ever had to a Silicon Valley coffee shop. Right. Uh, so that became like the meeting place. I do think, however, after this migration that's happening, you are going to see a lot of flags planted. And I think that that's a good thing. Uh, it seems, and this is just my initial take. I might be totally off about this, but it does seem that the folks that are coming from San Francisco are migrating towards Brickle because that kind of feels San Francisco E, you know, I'm it's got that many DACA faces. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> it feels San Francisco E, like in the sense that like, if it feels like a city, it feels like an urban dense city where you're walking around. I, I will always have a an affiliation, not affiliation, but more just like a just affinity. like a, affinity. There you go, an affinity towards the the Wynwood Midtown. I used to live in Midtown, that design district area. I think that's going to be great. But I do think Brickle slash Downtown because they're right next to each other are going to have a say in all this. And I think the more transplants that come from San Francisco, the more like folks that are engineers and designers, you're going to see them getting apartments in, in that area. And then obviously what Moshe Mana is doing and Michelle Abs is doing with Mana Tech in downtown, that's going to be a big thing when it comes to fruition and their vision comes, you know, totally to completion. So I see those as like the main two. If you're looking for places where I think folks will convene, I think those will be the two big ones. Uh, but love to hear everybody else's thoughts on what they think will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Max. Well, I was just going to say that um, I remember uh, Mayor Suarez very early on in, in his tenure saying that one of the things he was most excited about with the way that, and I don't love shouting out WeWork, but the way that the We WeWork footprint was happening in Miami was actually a traffic mitigation strategy. He was like, the fact that there's a WeWork in Coral Gables and one in, in Pinecrest and one in South, right? Like it allows people to not have to all be driving into one place and causing traffic. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I love that, you know, people can, if you don't have to go to downtown, you can go to your office, right? You have like a, a kind of satellite office with this. And I, I've, I've always thought about that with Miami is it's, there's um, so many great pockets of innovation, right? There, there is South Beach tech, there is Liber Liberty City tech, right? With um, Ecotech Visions, there is... Uh, tech happening in in the Pinecrest, you know, South Dade area, Corgate, right? Like it's and it's not as spread out as it is in San Francisco, where Silicon Valley Road is really in Palo Alto, and then you've got right. Oakland all the way over here, and then you've got Redwood, you know, like you, and, and then some people in San Francisco, like you literally have to take a Caltrain to make it to all your meetings. Here, you know, you do need a car, but I think it's a little bit more condensed. And I agree with you. I think it is the corridor of like the Grove to like Upper East Side, you yeah. know, that is really gonna be the concentration. Yeah, let's let's not sleep on the Grove. A ton of investments are happening in the Grove. There is, you know, just all sorts of, of you know, buildings being renovated and, and you know, there there's this energy and, and really it's like, it's one of the more pedestrian friendly yeah. uh, locations where you can bounce around. And then you could also be, you know, it's, it's close proximity to a residential neighborhood that's really, uh, you know, in, in high demand and, and whatnot. But my, my guess is that we're going to see Wynwood emerge um, for a very specific reason. And that is, I do think that the hottest neighborhood is the neighborhood I live in, in, in Edgewater, right? It's close proximity to that. And I also think that um, it's branded as 
a destination and and that's kind of important so i've seen a lot of people use phrases on twitter like you know if you look at uh the, the category of of person who's like in miami and an airbnb for like you know a month and a half to like figure things out here um they're like hey i'm gonna be uh in winwood for a month if anyone wants to you know actually uh meet up and i've never heard a local say that right like i've never actually heard so i think there's a, this weird brand and cachet to to winwood um and it's really coupled with a ton of new residential projects that are um, popping up. So okay. one weird thing, does Wynwood have a hotel? I don't think Wynwood has a hotel. No, but I think Midtown is starting to have a couple that popped up. I think we saw Hi. that Eight Sleep just yesterday, it hide, right? But Eight Sleep just yesterday announced that they're doing like an eight suite, like, right, that you can kind of come to Miami and then they have a, a, a partnership yeah. with a hotel. No, where you can actually rent a hotel room in Midtown that has eight sleep beds. So you could try out the technology while you're here. And I believe that's in Midtown. I'm not 100% sure, but I think yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. At the like, like, oh, I want to go to Wynwood. Uh, what hotel should I say? I'm like, there are no hotels in Wynwood, I realize. So it's at Hyde, right? Yeah. Maria. Right. But I mean, yeah, there's yeah. hotels right there in Edgewater, you know, and the, I mean, the beauty of all this is that you're five minutes away. You can take a yeah, bird scooter. or lime scooter or whatever, yeah, like you the, know, you can take a $5 Uber ride. And also, let's not forget, there's also a great co-working space right in the middle of all this stuff at a uh, space called Tribe right there in yeah, Overtown. In Overtown, yeah. Which yeah, is yeah. like, I think that's an area we're all sleeping on too. Yeah. You know, there's that's a lot of investment way. going on that. Yeah. Where the Virgin Trail yeah. uh, Depot yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. I think yesterday yesterday they just announced that um, Michael Simpkins, uh, and I forget the name of the other investor, just purchased a large plot in Overtown. And, you know, for many years, he's been talking about building out an innovation district. And he's a huge refresh supporter. So thank you, Michael Simpkins. <laughs> um, but yeah, it'll be, yeah, shout out to Michael. So it'll be interesting to see how that area develops as well. Agreed. I, I think... I keep seeing on Twitter um, that a common theme for these, obviously these New Yorkers in San Francisco is that they keep coming into town. They want walkability, right? They want to come in. They want to have an apartment. They want to go downstairs, grab a bagel, grab a slice of pizza, get coffee. The really like, obviously Brickell's there. It's more established in that sense, Brickell downtown. Um, but Wynwood and Midtown has great walkability as well, especially. Long Beach too. I mean, literally yeah, I lived on Lincoln yeah. Road and it very was true. amazing. Like, I didn't need my car on the weekends and there were right. five supermarkets in like a two second radius. It was insane. Right. And what's happening in the design district is just nutty. If you've been into the design district lately, it's like a new city, you know, it looks like from the future, that little area, you know, so I went to dash right there. Right. So design and architecture right. senior high is literally like in the middle of the design district. And I, I remember the days where literally it was the Taco Bell and the Denny's, like that's all you could go to, to eat. And now there's yep. like, tons of and it's just uh the design district is is so cool now no i think a lot of people are ending up in edgewater from what i hear is because uh, although brickle has a lot of kind of access and views to water like edgewater has so many buildings and so much waterfront right. that a lot of folks are like the how do, i could never get these views in any other city at you know metropolitan city so i think that's why i keep finding more and more folks that are at least getting apartments in Edgewater, and so they'll probably that might kind of play into where they want to work and and, and do business. You guys, you know, all, I saw my first vest yesterday when I was on the run. <laughs> Got no. it. Yeah, yep, yep, it happened. It was a Salesforce vest, and I was like, "It's here. We are. We're you know, oh, like no. the, the it's tech has landed." <laughs> You know, we should have, Maria, in our Miami Tech Manifesto, we should have literally dedicated a line to like, if you wear a vest, we will jump you. We will take it <laughs> off of you. We will throw it. We will, we will, we will somehow ecologically in a nice green way, destroy it and, and help you dress properly for Miami. And give you a Wyoweta. <laughs> <laughs> Miami Tech Pod merch, uh, no vest zone t-shirts will be on oh, sale. Maybe that's what we should do. We should have like a trade program. Like, oh, give me that. <laughs> that weird vest thing that you're wearing and here's a nice refresh uh t-shirt <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll donate it to you know uh like poor villages uh, abroad or something and, and yeah. we'll, we'll like those, trade in for a refresh t-shirt that's a great move those those yeah those vests are just so bro um it's really <laughs> terrible uh yeah yeah I, i've never 
personally wanted like my chest and my sleeves to feel different temperatures, but I, I've never understood. <laughs> look, look, I've never understood the purpose of it. Oh like, <laughs> from from like a clothing attire, like it is the most meaningless thing you can put on yourself, right? It's like a a flotation device. Yes! <laughs> like, I, don't understand. I also have always wondered i'm like but your arms aren't they cold like why right. just, yeah i don't get it and then i'm like no oh my god i thought okay okay i thought it was just me i'm so no, glad that we no i think i think all miamians are bewildered by the the vest and what 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 it is and what it represents you know why also because us miamians we know you always keep a sweater in the car right indoors is Epping freezing, right? Like the movie theater, polar ice. And then outside it's 90 degrees, right? So it's like, you always have a sweater in the car. Never would I think, oh, let me do a half ass right. <laughs> where I don't cover my arms. <laughs> Never. All right. Uh, Will, let's let's move on. You have a, uh, a clip on, from Lessons Via Leaders uh, this week. You, you had the, the man himself, Mayor Suarez, right? Yeah, absolutely. Our local celebrity. I mean, the mayor has been doing such a great job as a spokesperson for, for Miami and getting all these people to town. His, obviously, his Twitter feed is nonstop, and he's just doing his best to represent. And uh, he was nice enough to invite me over to his office down in City Hall, down in the Grove. And uh, we sat down. We had a little bit of talk. And one of the things I asked him was, like, how are you going to integrate all these newcomers uh, with all the people that have been building Miami Tech here for years. And we'll play that clip now. And then I'd love to get your thoughts on it. You mentioned it, like on a related note, uh, there's a lot of new folks coming into town. There's a lot of people that have been here for the past decade or so trying to build yeah. uh, this tech community. You know, Matt Hagman's of yeah. the world, Raul Most from the Knight Foundation, Great the people. Medinas, yep. Brian and Maria from Refresh. This Absolutely. has been a lot of work over the past decade. How do we ensure that all of these new people that are coming into Miami could also integrate with the people that are already here and make this as successful as possible? Yeah, and that's part of my job, yep. you know, and it's not an easy job sometimes. One of the things that I want to make sure is that we are as welcoming mm. uh, to them as other cities were unwelcoming to them. The reason why we have an opportunity with people who are creating, you know, uh, you know, making dreams into reality, VC funds, engineers, mm. the reason why this moment is happening, we have to be very conscientious of that is because other uh, other governments and other people didn't want them there. And so they're they're fleeing to and it's no, not too dissimilar from the story of how we left Cuba. You know what I mean? They're fleeing from a place that didn't want them, mm -hmm. that didn't want the you know that productive class to a place that does want them. And, and we have to make sure that we send that message. Now having said that, you know, they also have a responsibility, right? I think their responsibility is to learn from the reputational stuff that was happening in tech, whether it's true or false or whatever, whether it's a, a false narrative, even if it is a false narrative, mm -hmm. we live in a world where, where perception is reality. So you have to, you have to learn from that. You have to integrate all my conversations with people in tech have been, whether they're new or old, have been around inclusivity, have been around equity. And so I think that sort of rising tides lift all boats. Uh, so the more people that come that are creative, that are intellectual, the more intellectual capital we have, the more real capital we have, that's just going to benefit everybody. And of course, we have to make sure that, and that's my job as mayor in, con in collaboration with a lot of other organizations, that every child in Miami has an opportunity to enjoy that success. And that is, that's part of the dream. Awesome. All right. So you see, I, I gave a shout out, Maria and Brian, made sure to mention y'all. Appreciate it. Of course. Can I just say that you guys look like the the ninjas in Mortal Kombat, and I was expecting you guys to be like, "Get over here!" Like, <laughs> oh man, that's Scorp all I could think of. Scorpion? <laughs> what is it? It was yeah, Scorpion. It was a blue ninja. It was a blue and a yellow ninja, and they would Sub Zero. Did Sub Zero it? and Scorpion. Yeah. Okay, man. Damn. There cool. we go. Choose your fighter. Now you're not gonna. Okay, yeah, you can't unsee that. So when you play the people again, you're gonna be like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, what the mayor is saying is is true, right? I, I do agree with it, um, but I, I don't think it's it's going to be like this big kind of like uh, backlash accepting accepting issue like you know tribalism where there's like you know people that uh, are like in tech from you know the early uh, 2000s like Brian are just like no longer gonna. Uh, interact with all these new people moving here. I don't think that's going to be as big of an issue. Um, there will be kind of a, a more community feeling to it. It's my guess, especially as 
you know, organizations like Refresh start live events and everyone's like mixing together. And then you see, you know, people leaving uh, larger companies that open office space here to like joining smaller startups and, and whatnot. Um, the the bigger thing that I, I really want us to, uh, to, to really focus on is like th there is an affordability crisis around housing here. And there's some of these externalities that if you just have 10, 15, 20,000 individuals that are uh, high earners move into the city, like, yes, we should welcome them, but we should also keep an eye on what that does, uh, that the pressures that that puts on the people that are renting where, you know, 40 or 50 percent of their of their, you know, after tax salary goes to rent um, because, you know, the, the, the real estate industries here is, is, is not terribly forgiving, right? It's a supply and demand equation where they're going to say, well, okay, like I could charge for more rent, so I will. And I do think that we shouldn't freak out and reject and over index too much on it, but it's like government needs to prioritize the, the externalities of a ton of, of people moving here um, in a way that we haven't really been thinking about uh, too much because we haven't had a similar moment where, you know, at scale, people seem to be really interested in moving to the city. But do you, Caesar and, and the rest of you, do you guys think that the number of people moving from are in tech, right, from the Valley or from New York or wherever, right? Do you really think that number is far outpacing the number of people who move to Miami on an annual basis from all over the world? No, but if it's concentrated in neighborhoods, right, you may see a bit of a spillover effect, right? If, if everyone is suddenly trying to move to the same six or seven neighborhoods or the same six or seven areas, right? You know, are, are we like, and we should have like the, the, the real conversations about this, right? Like, are, are we actually going to be making, you know, rents in uh, Coconut Grove astronomical for the historically black neighborhood in Coconut Grove that has like been extremely central to the city of the, the, to the city's history right uh you know overtown adjacent to uh to downtown um you know little haiti just north of midtown like these are these are real things we should not freak out about but keep an eye on and, and be super aware of right yeah i um i hosted the mayor on clubhouse and um someone dm'd me uh and said hey i want to talk about this issue but i don't want to like ruin the mood um, and I, I wrote him back and I was like, no, please do. Like, this is part of the conversation. Um, this specifically, right, is just affordability and how do we make sure that the people, and that's ha that happened in Wynwood, right? A lot of the people that uh, lived in Wynwood got priced out um, who are red, long-time residents. Of, of that's a very San Francisco thing, brewing the mood. Like Miami, we don't care about that. Like, like, like <laughs> say what's on your mind, I forget the mood. And he was like, I, you know, I don't want to embarrass the mayor if the mayor doesn't want to talk. And I was like, are you kidding? The mayor super, up, like, super out uh, about this and and upfront about it. And and yeah, it's definitely something that we we have to consider. And then you know, you get into the conversation of of the school system as well, which is, uh, you know, kind of tied to that. Is okay. So there's affordability, um, you know, with housing, but then it's you you know, the public school system has a long way to go. It's it's improved a lot since when we were in it um in some in some pockets right and and not in all pockets and um and that's a, a big question that people are asking is when i move down here first of all you know where do i live it's going to be expensive i need a car right or i need to budget for some type of because you know there is no public transportation that's ready for this type of uh you know move and um and then i need to put my kids in in a school uh and i think those are the top three things that people are thinking about when they move down here. last thing i'll say about this and then i'll shut up like i i think that it's still also really important to understand that it is rare to have a mayor, a, you know, a, a public official with the, the power and platform that the mayor Suarez has um, be this much of a champion for tech and entrepreneurship to the point where he's like, let's look at the actual policies that we have in place. Let's look at our ordinances. Let's look at our zoning. Let's look at how the city invests its money. Um, and actually make changes to welcome a community that will provide a lot of opportunities for people that live here too. So I think that it, it's a bit of a balance, um, but we shouldn't really forget about that because there are a ton of cities that are just like, tech bros are the problem and they paint the entire industry with this very broad brush. Well, and, tech bros are, the, are a problem, but yeah. <laughs> but what, what ends up happening is 
tech bros are the problem, therefore caribou uh, sucks. And you're like, wait, hold on, I'm a Latina founder. And like, I, it doesn't matter, right? You're painting yeah. as an industry with yeah. this broad brush and there's no segmentation because you're looped in on that. And I think that having the inverse of, of you know, Francis as, or the mayor as a, as a, as a champion is, is helpful, but it also gives us that opportunity to be more thoughtful about the, the externalities of the, the yeah, I agree. I mean, look, we're, we have the unique opportunity right now and privilege that we have the cell phone numbers of the mayor of the city and the mayor of the county, because a lot of these things are county level issues, right? Because uh, Mayor uh, Levine, she's overseeing millions and millions of people and acres of land and, you know, and all these other issues that are at, decided at a county level, too. So the fact that we have as an industry, like direct access to both of them is something that, you know, isn't really, doesn't happen in normal, uh, normal cities or whatever. And she, the county oversees transportation, right? Like and education. education. That's the, that's the thing. I remember when uh, Manny Diaz was mayor, uh, he was like, people complain to me about the, about the education system, but it's a countywide education system. He's like, I'm only the mayor of Miami, which is Francis's situation. He's only the mayor of the city of Miami. You can't, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot. So I think, and I, I love that um, Mayor Suarez and Mayor Living Cava are working together. It seems like on this because they realize, uh, you know, he's, he's got kind of the attention. He's, he's gotten the, uh, you know, people to, to take, you know, uh, I don't know what the word is, but like to, to pay attention to us. And then Mayor Levine Kava is like, okay, I can help actually make these countywide things happen, which is, is awesome. And she's the first woman mayor of uh, of Miami. I think we should say that. And the first Jewish mayor. It's, amazing. Really it's a huge deal. It's yeah. huge. Great. Mar Maria, Will, you guys have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I, real quick uh, on this topic, I, I think um, the whole integration of newcomers into the tech community specifically, I think, you know, folks like Maria and Brian are doing a great job with that. I have to applaud Maria for the Twitter, you know, activity that I see. On her oh, my gosh. Like every time someone's like, hey, I'm in town, Maria's up there like, hey. Check out Refresh Miami. Let me know how it could help. So props to you, Maria. Mar Maria's going to start picking people up from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> oh don't put it past me i will that would be full oh, service yeah. back, like for like emotional therapy she's gonna be like oh my god welcome to miami meet these little dogs yeah uh, the mayor understand. the mayor is like hey that that, that like he, he's obviously kind and says like yeah you know it's my job to integrate people but the mayor can't do it all himself uh you know and, and props to the community for really you know taking the bull by the horns and props to you know the, the folks at refresh maria and brian for doing that uh, but all, also the, the stuff that you were talking about, this whole housing issue, this is also not something that's tech specific. Again, with our with our discussion that we had on a prior episode where this is this big reset that we're going through where people are going to decide where they want to live, not where they have to live. Miami is going to be, Flor South Florida is going to be at the top of the list for folks that are not in the tech community as well. We're going to see a huge immigration of people from all over the country coming to Florida. Housing is a big topic that we got to figure out, not just uh, in our little tech bubbles, but just uh, as a as a city and as a region as a whole. So just stuff that uh, we just need to be mindful of. You know, one last thing that I wanted to add. Sorry to interrupt, Maria. Like, I think one thing we forget is that the tech industry, for every job it creates directly, there's like three or four extra jobs that are created in the community as a result. And so, like, we have to be mindful as a community as a whole that like, we need to diversify our uh, our economy away from so, some of these things that are so sensitive to the next pandemic or the next, you know, recession or, or whatever, you know, like, you couldn't pay me to get on a cruise ship for the next 12 months, you know, mm -hmm. like, that industry is not coming back as soon as, it, as we think. And that's 50,000, 100,000 people in the city who work in that industry. You know? Major industry here, yeah. I've been pleasantly surprised of a lot of the folks that are coming in, you know, they're asking, how can, how can we help? How can we get integrated into the community? And so I've been hosting, having a lot of these calls and a lot of it, it's, I'm very used to kind of putting refresh out there and saying, how can we help you? But then when they ask me, how can they help? I'm like, uh, I, I don't know yet. Like, mm -hmm. this is great. You know, right now I think we're just trying to get everybody integrated. And, uh, I think, you know, Saif has been great as well about kind of welcoming people. I think everybody as a community and Miami, I don't know if they're, we're very known for being like 
hospitable and like welcoming because, you know, we have a lot of transplants. Everybody kind of has their group, but I can only imagine what it feels like for these people on Twitter to put out that, hey, I'm moving to Miami and having like 20 people from Miami going, welcome. How can we help? Let's meet for coffee. Like, I think the community as a whole has been incredible and welcoming. And I, that's what I love to see because as you know, as we're all Miami natives, like I don't I don't think we've had that fama <laughs> previously. So I'm I'm loving it. I mean, the fact that you don't say you can sponsor a podcast right after someone says, how can we help? I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that, but let's, no, let's not forget <laughs> here, right? <laughs> we're looking I thought for we were all waiting on uh, new eight sleep mattresses, right? Isn't that what we're <laughs> Brian's going to just start calling people out. All right, eight sleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> trying, to, trying to hustle mattresses here. <laughs> Maria, you made a really good point, which is when they say, how can we help the Miami tech community? Um, I think our answer should be get to know us and get to know all of the diverse parts of the ecosystem. Don't just go meet with the bros and the dudes and and have your usual you know, bro bromances. Like just you know, really do your job to understand who we are and get to know us all and meet with us all and understand the the tech ecosystem that we've been building, you know, since, since Brian started it, right? Like, and, and, and what we've done with it. And I think really try to integrate yourself um, in what we're trying to do. Don't, don't come down here and be like, Oh, blank slate. I'm going to like create. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Yeah. Leave your savior complex wherever it is. <laughs> we will cut you. <laughs> All right. Max with the mic drop, we're going to wrap up episode three of the Miami tech pod. Um, Max, thanks for, for joining. I mean, it was an awesome episode. Um, you know, I know this is going to launch, uh, caribou to even higher on the charts. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you, we'll get you five iTunes. new users, Max, five. <laughs> it's That's all I'll, take that. I'll take that. <laughs> um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, and Google podcasts and, uh, visit us on miamitechpod.com. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Miami Tech Pod. Uh, please share this episode with anyone who's interested in learning more about the Miami Tech community. And we will see you on episode four.